First talk speaker is Patricia Tischjens, who will be, her talk is entitled Mindfulness-Based Approaches to Promoting Student Learning, Attention, and Self-Regulation. And we're particularly excited to have Tish here today because she'll be joining the University of Virginia as an associate professor in January, about which we are tremendously excited. Tish is a very prominent expert in the field of contemplative pedagogy. She has worked for many years, and first in California, later at the Garrison Institute, and most recently at Penn State as assistant professor in human development and family studies, and soon to be at the University of Virginia. She led the faculty team that developed the Cultivating Awareness and Resilience in Education, Care for Teachers, which is a mindfulness-based program for teachers designed to reduce stress and promote improvements in classroom climate and student academic and behavioral outcomes. And I could say a lot about all the things that Tish has done, but she's truly a ubiquitous figure. And I've been getting to know her over the past year and been really amazed at her presence in almost every context I ever look at, every conference I talk to, and so forth. So we're really excited to have her here at the university and here today. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was a really, really nice intro. Thank you. And, and thanks to all the uh, Oh, I guess. No, that's the wrong, wrong one. Sure. Okay, Mike. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, thanks to all the organizers, uh, Patrick and everybody for inviting me. There we go. Um, uh, it's been a really wonderful conference, well uh, organized, and I really enjoy the, their talks around nutrition and, and uh, exercise, and I, I'm seeing linkages between the work that I'm doing and those those talks as well, which I may briefly touch upon. But um, the purpose of my talk today is to give you an overview of the interventions that are, are developing um, in this area in the field of uh, education, mindfulness-based approaches to promoting student learning, attention, and self-regulation. Um, this is a really nascent field, and all the research that's, that we have today is very preliminary, so I, I just have to give you that uh, you know, caveat. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the construct of mindfulness, what it is, what the practice of it is. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the effects that we know exist on adult developmental processes. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the issues that are related to translating that research into school-based programs for children and youth. Um, finally, I'm going to review the uh, data that does exist on uh, certain programs out there that, that uh, schools have been using. Um, and then finally I'll end with giving you uh, some, a summary of uh, what we still need to know before we can really be successful in, in uh, integrating this work into school settings. Um, okay. So you may be familiar with John Kabat-Zinn. Um, who started mindfulness-based stress reduction, and it's been studied for over 30 years now. Um, it was developed at the University of Massachusetts uh, Medical Center, uh, and um, he defines mindfulness in his work as paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. That's an early definition, and later he, he called it an awareness of one's contact, conduct and the quality of one's relationships, inwardly and outwardly, in terms of their potential to cause harm. And these are intrinsic elements of the cultivation of mindfulness. And the other thing that John Kabat-Zinn emphasizes is that mindfulness um, ultimately needs to be applied to one's everyday life. Um, it's something that you may practice on your own, but to really have the effects that we're hoping to in terms of behavioral change, it needs to be integrated into one's life. So there's a growing body of research that's been showing really promising results among adult populations, including enhanced memory, increased ability to concentrate, increased ability to use attention to regulate emotion, which is really an important piece that we think may help kids. Um, increased ability for empathy and compassion, another dimension that may be important for children. And reduced distress and increased positive affect. And there is some evidence also that there uh, that it results in brain changes that support emotion regulation. Uh, for example, um, these are data from Hotzel et al. from 2008, um, showing increased density in hippocampus uh, after eight weeks of mindfulness-based stress reduction. This was was pretty exciting re results from this data. Um, 
<clears throat> so the, the developmental issues when it comes to contemplative ac applications for children and youth. Uh, first I want to say that what we're talking about here are practices such as mindfulness meditation, yoga, um, tai chi, um, and other kinds of contemplative approaches to the arts, um, things like that. And um, these are practices that you can uh, spend time on on your own or you can work on together in group settings. But when we think about applying these techniques to children, especially in school settings, um, we really have to think about the brain and nervous system development, um, what's developmentally appropriate. Um, we have to think about the phases of proliferation and pruning. Uh, you know, what, what kinds of timing do we need to think about in terms of, of how these kinds of techniques might be well integrated into the developmental, um, our developmental understanding. Um, there's sitting practices designed for adults, like mindfulness meditation, may not be appropriate for young children. It may just not, you know, having asking them to sit still may not be really appropriate. Or the way that we introduce it may be really important. Um, also, the wisdom traditions from which these practices have been adapted um, do not really provide us much direction. Um, one idea is that perhaps the focus on movement, the sense like yoga, the senses, uh, focusing attention on senses, um, nature and art might be really nice ways to integrate these kinds of activities into school settings. But obviously we need a lot more research to find out how to do this best. So the evidence program, evidence-based programs that do exist out there, um, here's a list of them. Uh, when I was at the Garrison Institute, we spent several years um, compiling all the research on these kinds of programs. And you can now find this in a searchable database on this website if you are interested in looking for them. So on that website, you can find all kinds of programs. But the really, the only ones that we found that have data uh, or an evidence base are these. On um, the Holistic Life Foundation Yoga Program, Ali Smith, who's on our panel, will be talking about that program. The Inner Kids Program, Inner Resilience Program, which <coughs> evolved out of the... Uh, Trauma of 9-11 in New York City, Linda Lantieri developed that program. Learning to, to Breathe program, Mind Up, and Transformative Life Skills, um, the Nairoga Institute. Today, I'm gonna to talk about some data from research on the Inner Kids program, the Learning to Breathe program, and Mind Up. So first, the Inner Kids program, and I have to thank my colleagues, Susan Smalley, and Lisa Fluke, and Brian Gala for sharing their slides with me so that I could uh, present this. Um, the Inner Kids program is based on mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, applied to younger children. So it was mainly designed originally for uh, early childhood and, and uh, early elementary school. And it has three primary units based on attention, a uh, focus on the five senses, uh, balance and movement, and clarity and compassion. Um, They've, uh, they conducted at University of uh, California, Los Angeles, uh, three randomized controlled trials. I'm only gonna give you a little overview of one of the studies, study two, that took place um, in one elementary school with four classrooms. They had 64 kids, um, 32 were randomized to, have the, to receive the intervention. The control group got um, a silent reading period and they block randomized by classroom. Um, and classroom gender and, uh, and age. Oops, jumping ahead, okay. Um, so this was published in the Journal of Applied School Psychology back in uh, 2010. Um, but they did show, now this, this is self, this is teacher report and uh, parent report of children's executive function. Uh, and it's really questions about behavior. Um, and so you can see uh, what they found was an interaction effect. Uh, whereby baseline executive function, uh, so those, those kids who were low in EF to begin with showed greater gains than those who were not in the experimental group compared to the control group. So basically what that says is kids who really needed help with, with executive function showed greater gains. So that's, that's exciting. Um, but clearly the, these data in this study is very limited, it has a very small sample. Um, the reporters were biased. They knew about the condition that the kids were, um, you know, assigned to. So, you know, that's one of the things about this research is it, it has a lot of limitations. But it's still interesting and possibly promising. 
Now, MindUp uh, was developed by the Hahn Foundation. Yeah, that's Goldie Hahn. Uh, and uh, <laughs> she developed it. Um, and she started this process in Vancouver, where her son was studying hockey. Or he, was, he wanted to be a hockey player, so they moved to Vancouver. And uh, she collaborated with my really good friend, Kimberly Shonet Wright, who was at the University of British Columbia. And now the whole southern mainland of British Columbia is saturated with Mind Up. All the schools are doing this program and is now published by Scholastic. Um, so they, they spent about 10 years developing this program. And I've been following it because they asked me to be an advisor on their, the development of their program. And uh, I think it's been pretty successful. So um, the program, uh, here's, the, here's the pictures of it. You can buy these um, on Amazon. So those of you who are teachers and work in schools, if you're interested in this, um, this is an easily acceptable, accessible program that you can do on your own. It has, uh, oh, this one has some bells and whistles, there we go. Um, this one has, uh, these, all these are the units. It starts out with learning about attention and focused attention, um, and then practice, developing awareness of sensory input is a big part of it. Um, some of the else, they also have positive psychology embedded in here, like perspective take, taking, optimism, and, uh, oh, and also things like acts of kindness and gratitude. Um, the program has now actually been um, qualified to go to fit into the collaborative for academic social emotional learning castle um, website or uh, select programs for social emotional programs. Okay, let's move ahead. Um, so I'm going to give you a, uh, a little over, brief overview of a randomized controlled trial data from that. Um, these were uh, 9, 9, 4th, and 5th graders drawn from four classrooms, uh, two mind up classrooms that received 12 weeks of the program, and two comparison groups that uh, focused on social responsibility. So in um, British Columbia, social responsibility is one of the curricular areas that they have to focus on. It's parallel to social emotional learning here in the United States. Um, so these are change scores in student reports of mindfulness, optimism, emotional control, positive affect, and negative affect. And you can see the Mind Up program kids Im improved, and the other kids uh, got worse. <laughs> so one of the things they found in the study, they also uh, looked at e executive function using computer-based um, assessments, and they also looked at cortisol uh, uh, diurnal cortisol. And in both of those, they found that over the course of the school year, uh, kids' per performance on all those tasks and, and the cortisol kind of got worse over the school year, which you can imagine. Uh, you know, school seemed to wear them out. Um, whereas the kids who had mind up didn't show those effects. So, so it seemed that mind up may have protective factors. So here are uh, perfect, per protective effects, sorry. Here's some more change scores. Um, this is school self-concept. These are still uh, student reports. Empathy, perspective taking, social responsibility, depressive symptoms. Peer, now these are peer ratings. So this is having peers rate one another. And you can see that, um, again, you see big differences in the two groups in terms of sharing, trustworthiness, helpfulness, and perspective taking. And <clears throat> this is a sociometric status where kids are uh, asked to rate one another as to whether they would want to be friends with them. And you can see here, too, that the Mind Up kids are uh, rating each other in a more positive way. Um, these are peer ratings of antisocial behaviors in terms of uh, fighting and breaking rules. Um, they also looked at these data in terms of Cohen's U uh, score looking at improvement index. Um, they found a 24% gain in positive social behaviors, uh, 15 in math achievement, which is pretty exciting, 20% in self-reported social emotional competencies and skills, and 24% in aggressive behaviors. So that's a reduction in aggressive behaviors. <laughs> <clears throat> the last program I'm going to talk about is Learning to Breathe. This one is also published. It's just recently published. If you go to Amazon and Google it, you'll find it. I can't remember who the publisher is. This was developed by my friend Trish Broderick, and these are slides she uh, loaned to me as well. Um, this program, she is a mindfulness-based stress reduction trainer, 
And she'd been working at Westchester University on, uh, she's a school psychologist by background, and she was really interested in, in uh, adolescent emotion regulation and wanted to see if she could apply some of the MBSR uh, tools to helping adolescents. And uh, so she developed Learning to Breathe. And it's based on uh, this idea that as you enhance emotion regulation, you can strengthen attention and performance, uh, support pro-social behavior, build stress management skills, and improve health and well-being. And <clears throat> the uh, program is based on ac the acronym BREATHE, and it has these themes. So B is for body, R is for reflections or thoughts, E is for emotions, A is for attention, T is for tenderness, or take it as it is, it's the non-judgmental awareness dimension. And H, habits for a healthy mind, and E, empowerment, gain, the inner edge. One thing I like about this program is it's very strength-based. She found her early on working with kids talking about stress. They didn't want to admit that they were stressed out. Um, you know, they didn't want to self-disclose that. So rather than taking a you know, stress reduction orientation, she took a empowerment um, uh, support kind of approach, which I really like. <coughs> The other thing she did was she linked with her program to state standards uh, in Pennsylvania and Maryland. I, she's, I, she's been working in a lot of different areas, including Canada. She worked in Ontario. So everywhere she's gone, she's been looking at the state standards and seeing where they link in terms of health education, primarily, physical education. Um, she's done a lot of different research uh, implementations in these all these different settings. And there's, uh, there's actually three published um, articles. I, she just published one that I didn't get on the slide in time, but um, the Bordock and Metz article um, was published in 2009, and she and I published an article on um, uh, emotion regulation and youth that talks about learning to breathe as well in 2012. So in all these different implementations, she's found consistent results, um, improvements in calmness, self-acceptance, emotion regulation, understanding emotions and clarity of awareness, and reductions in negative mood, somatic symptoms, and tiredness and aches and pains. And she's gotten a lot of qualitative data from her work too. Um, most of the participants really enjoyed it. Um, and they, many of them uh, still reported practicing outside of the regular class, which to me really, that was a very surprising result to me because I didn't anticipate the adolescents would do that. Um, and one of the important results was that more than about half said they learned how to let go of distressing thoughts and feelings in order to control their stress level. So, after giving you a data blitz here <laughs> of all these programs, um, what more do we need to know? Well, obviously we need to know a lot because everything I've shown you today is very preliminary. Um, there's a lot of shortcomings in these, uh, these results. Uh, in these studies, we need to understand more specifically how specific activities may result in certain outcomes and what the mechanism is involved in that. We really don't know a lot about what's going on there. Um, we need to understand better what's developmentally appropriate, culturally appropriate in educational settings. Um, there's a lot of issues related to how we introduce these activities in school settings, how we, the vocabulary we use, um, and the other question is, are, you know, is this work generalizable to broader populations? They've been studied in very small settings and small populations. What kinds of effects are we having on brain development? That's a big question. We really have no idea. And what are the long-term academic and behavioral outcomes that may result from these kinds of interventions? So um, those, I'll just leave you with those thoughts to ponder. And uh, you'll learn in our, the next two speakers, we'll talk a little bit about how they have been applying these in, in their settings. So thank you.